Thank you, Dr. Nurse, and for, you wel for welcoming me to Rockefeller. I'm honored to be here and want to thank the members of the jury for the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize for inviting me to participate in the presentation. I would also like to offer congratulations to Dr. Lyon. Finally, I want to commend the Green Guards for establishing this prize. I'm not going to talk for very long today, but I do want to say how significant I believe this award to be, specifically because it honors hard work for women. Now, we generally now expect women to work, and we flatter ourselves that we give them every encouragement to work, every opportunity. It has, however, occurred to me that there remain deep in the culture attitudes and beliefs that still work to guide women away from the pursuit of excellence. Some years ago, when my daughter was graduating from a girls' school on the west side of Los Angeles, I was asked to give the baccalaureate address. I'm afraid I seized this opportunity to hector the parents who were present. And nothing could have kept them from being present, as nothing could have kept me from hectoring them. What I felt impelled to tell them that day was that they needed to demand more of their daughters. Now this particular school, this was a girl's school, was very academically oriented. It produced Westinghouse science scholars. It produced the first woman to enter space, the physicist Sally Ride. The school sent a mess did send a message that work was hard and work was worthwhile. The parents, however, did not, on the whole, reinforce this message. Many of them, in fact, undercut it at every opportunity. During the six years Quintana spent at this school, the one predictable complaint from the parents was too much homework. So at the graduate, on the back day of the baccalaureate, I read them some letters that Scott Fitzgerald wrote to his own 17-year-old daughter, nagging her, desperate to get her to make a commitment to work. These letters were full of instructions on how she could best improve herself. She should compare the workers' housing projects in Rotterdam with tenements in New York. She should pick up a certain book about architecture and apply herself to it. She should take her former nanny to lunch. Above all, she should remember this, quote, I don't want you to live in an unreal world or to believe that the system that produced Barbara Hutton, Barbara Hutton was the Paris Hilton of the moment. <laughs> can survive more than 10 years, any more than the French monarchy could survive 1789. Every girl your age in America will have the experience of working for her living. To shut your eyes to that is like living in a dream. To say, I will do valuable and indispensable work is the best part of wisdom and courage. Now it's clear to anybody reading these letters that part of Fitzgerald's urgency derived from his particular situation. His his wife was incapable, he was ill, and would in fact die a few years later. There would very soon be for that daughter no money, no cushion, no one at all to nag her, take care of her, keep her on track. It is also clear that Fitzgerald knew exactly how tenuous, how perilous, how fraught with opportunities for wrong turnings those next few years would be for his daughter. Those years when female children of the middle class either take hold of their lives or do not. In other words, he worried about his daughters getting the point precisely because she was a daughter. Now this is an area in which many of us worry more about our daughters than we do about our sons, and with good reason. For all those reasons still fixed in the culture, our sons tend to grow up getting the point about work. They grow up knowing that they will be expected to support themselves, expected to work, expected, and whether or not they resist this expectation or not is beside the point. Expected to define their lives in terms of work, in terms of achievement, in terms of what they do and how well they do it. This definition remains fixed, whether they resist or drop out or go with it. If a boy resists, he is rebelling against something solid, a fixed expectation. If a boy drifts or drops out, he drifts away from or drops out of, again, a fixed expectation, a solid mooring. 
The signals we send our daughters are rather more complicated, more mixed, often at their best even, neb nebulous. Drift is all too possible. Drift is even obscurely encouraged. Most of us ex say that we expect our daughters to work, but there remains ambiguity about how they are expected to feel about this work, about what their best interests are, about what their priorities should be, about what we want for them. We often say that we want them to be happy, which is certainly true, but it is just as certainly an inadequate prescription for living. When they are very small, we may well look at them and think of the famous lines from the Yeats poem, A Prayer for My Daughter, and may her bridegroom bring her to a house where all's accustomed ceremonious. And if we do not think of those particular lines, we think of some variation on them, some private prayer that our daughters will be allowed to, by others to live with grace and ceremony. In other words, we assign them instinctively a passive role in their own fate. We do not mind saying of them that they are spoiled. In fact, we sometimes, I sometimes hear it said proudly as if it were evidence of the ability to provide. Very few parents would say pri proudly that a son was spoiled, just as very few parents would dismiss a son's future by advising him to be happy. We are more lenient on the subject of a daughter's future, and we, when we talk about her working, we tend to regard it as one of many possible options, a luxury to which she is now entitled, a diversion to be pursued for just so long as it gives her pleasure, makes her happy, then dropped or set aside. We even define happiness for our daughters in a special way. We define it as being comfortable or secure or happy right now, this very minute, overlooking the possibility that comfort and security at 20 and 30 can lead to boredom and dissatisfaction at 40 and 50. We encourage our daughters to take up a craft or a profession, but we continue to discourage the very risks and insecurities and downright drudgery implicit in the actual practice, let alone the mastery of that craft or profession. We encourage them to be writers, say. We think of writing as a clean occupation that you pursue at home. It's like needlepoint. But we <laughs> discourage them from leading the kind of life writers actually lead, which is solitary, reclusive, selfish, and involves a level of commitment that is not pretty to watch. Our pictures of our daughters at this future work t still really do tend to the pretty. If we see them as like photographers, we see them in a studio shooting portraits, never on the wrong side of a police line. If we picture them in the fashion business, we see the Paris collections, the fashion room at Vogue. We don't see them tr trudging a portfolio around 7th Avenue in August. If we picture them as lawyers, we see them in some very attractive situation. Not going to a prison in the middle of the night to see a client, not even doing the kind of exhausting civil work that is the basis of most law practiced in this country. I recall seeing an approving Mother's Day piece about a young woman who had abandoned the practice of law for which she had been extensively and expensively trained to spend more time with her baby. She said that she found this more fulfilling, and I am confident that she did. A baby is infinitely more fun, even more challenging than the dog work most young lawyers spend their time doing, but the piece had troubled me. I wondered whether her husband had ever had that option. I wondered whether her brother would have had that option. And I wondered most of all what options she would have when she was 40 and this no longer quite so young mother tried to go back to law and found herself starting all over again at the dog work level. So I talked about all of that this day to this parent, these parents who thought their daughters had too much homework. <laughs> and when I finished, a mother I knew stopped me, and she said that her husband and she had been very impressed by what I said. In fact, they wanted me to talk to their daughter, <laughs> who was insisting, despite everything they had tried to tell her, that she wanted to be a doctor. Couldn't I talk to her, the mother asked, and explain what a hard life that would be. <laughs> I don't think anybody here today needs to be told how hard it can be, or that the joy of achievement, the very value of life, lies in how hard we can make it, 
or what a gift Paul Greengard and Ursula have given women everywhere. It's a gift not just to its recipients, not just to women who have already distinguished themselves. It's a gift that can speak in a direct way to every 17-year-old who wants to be a doctor and whose parents still tell her it's too hard. Thank you.